Visiting with Hewell Hauser is made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation. Hello everybody, I'm Hewell Hauser, and here we are about nine o'clock on a Wednesday morning right on the corner of a busy sunset and vine, and we are literally getting ready to have an honest-to-goodness Los Angeles adventure today. We are going to be traveling all over our city uh, to look at statues. We have statues all over our city, hundreds of them, and it is my contention that very few of us really know very much about those statues. So today we're going to explore and look at statues, find out their history, why they were put there in the first place, and we have a whole panel of experts here who are going to be our tour guides today. And tell us why you all are with us today. Introduce yourselves in that way for our audience. My name is Julie Suleiman. For about a two-year period of time, I directed a the California portion of a national effort that was called Save Outdoor Sculpture. It was an effort uh, involving hundreds of volunteers um, throughout our, our region who helped us first locate the sculpture in our environment and then research a little information about it. We were, we were able to find about 1,200 sculptures in Southern California. And wait a minute, wait a minute now. There's our first significant number. 1,200 sculptures. In the lower half of the state mm -hmm. and over 500 in Los Angeles County alone. 500 statues in Los Angeles. County, yes. And we're going to do about 15 of them today. So we're really just scratching the surface. We've come up with a list of the 15 we want to visit today. And Susan, you're going to explain to us why we're here and kind of point out to us the kinds of things that we can discover as we go through the day. Tell us about this statue, which is sitting here inside of a fountain that's not working here uh, this morning. Well, the fountain should be working. And the sculpture is by Paul Manship, who is a really popular and highly loved uh, sculptor of the 1920s and 30s and 40s. And the piece is a wonderful story, and it's too bad that people driving by so quickly can't get it all, but it's an, it's an incipient marriage and love affair and wooing. It tells the tale of this lovely Phoenician princess, uh, Europa, who was wooed by none other than the great god Zeus, or Jupiter. And he saw her, was just taken aback by her as she was picking flowers by the seaside in Phoenicia, and disguised himself as a bull. He didn't think that he'd woo her as being the king god, but as a bull he could do it. And he said, come with me, which she did. She hopped upon his back, and he crossed the Mediterranean to Crete, where he was going to take her, which he did, and ravish her, as they say. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> And, um, and all of this is, is kind of spelled out yes, on this statue. that's right. And there should be, the sculptor wanted water around, around the bull to symbolize the Mediterranean. And it was to be for the original collector's swimming pool there. So that it, would, it would be surrounded by water. And four dolphins carry the future bridal couple away. And that's little Eros, or Cupid, the god of love. On the top. On the top. Um, whispering sweet nothings into an enchanted Europa's ear. And here the statue is today, sitting yes. on the corner after all these years of sunset and vine. That's right. I pass by this statue every day. Well, it's an original love story, so for sunset and vine it makes a lot of sense. I had no, <laughs> see, I don't think we know these stories. How are we supposed to know all of this? Well, uh, I mean, the, 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 this is something that is exciting and interesting to know about. Well, SOS is working on this, and um, the image itself, though, is delightful. And even if you don't know the full story, there's something magical, I think, in this relationship. Um, it, it's ebullient, uh, joyful, lithe, and blithe, and it, it, uh, I think it's a, a charming piece. Even without uh, the water even today. Even without the water, even without knowing the true love of Zeus and Europa. Okay, now see, there's our first story. It went way too long. We're never going to be able to fit 15 in, but actually you're leaving us now. <laughs> That's right. And not going to hook back up with us That's again. Until? Until you know where. Right. That's later on in the show. 
But this gentleman, your name is? Uh, Mike Severo. And you are representing? Uh, Urban Art Inc. So that's another one of these groups that's restoring all of these statues. Right. And actually, I uh, got interested in public art, uh, picking up on something Susan said about uh, the stories not being known. Uh, I, uh, about 15 years ago, I started researching the public art in downtown Los Angeles with the idea of writing guides to the public art in uh, downtown Los Angeles. And I've written three of them, but uh, uh, in the, as, as the uh, years have gone by, I've met other people, including Julie, and uh, we have uh, broadened our activities to include the uh, county of Los Angeles. And, uh, so you're helping us find out the stories. Absolutely. And Glenn Wharton, yes. is you're, you're interested in the restoration part of this. That's right. I'm a sculpture conservator. So probably what I bring to this is just an understanding of the materials and how they deteriorate, but also how to, how to look at sculptures and know what you're seeing. I was first brought in um, to the Save Outdoor Sculpture Project by Julie, who asked me to train some of the hundreds of volunteers that she organized throughout Southern California to show them how to look at a, a three-dimensional work of art and what, what you're seeing there when a bronze starts to turn green or, or red and how to appreciate it from a material point of view. So we're really going to be up to speed before the day is over, and this is our first stop we're all gonna get into, I guess, separate cars. I'm not sure how we're gonna work this out. We got lots of quarters for parking meters today, and we're starting out to visit the great, wonderful, and very diverse collection of statues we have all over the city of Los Angeles. Now we have left Sunset and Vine and come downtown to Olvera Street. We got music in the background, we got tourists all around us, and it's very appropriate because this is a name, this is a statue of a man we should all be familiar with, but I think really we're not. Uh, it's Felipe de Neva, who was the uh, first governor of uh, the Californias. He established uh, the two uh, first two cities in the uh, state of California, uh, San Jose in 1777 and the uh, Los Angeles in 1781. It conveys a romantic uh, view of uh, the governor. There is no known photo or, or, or uh, painting of uh, De Neva. So, so how did they decide what he was going to look like? Well, you know, I, I it's, I, I, there, there's probably two things that uh, the costume is roughly comparable to what so what were called soldiers of leather uh, wore. He was a military man. He spent uh, his whole adult life uh, in the military. So the the uniform is kind of roughly uh, accurate. What his face looked like, nobody knows. Well, no. we've got the statue to him anyway. Yeah. And, and, and this statue is of particular interest to you because of? Well, as a conservator, I'm looking at materials and I'm looking at how people interact with art. And here I see a sculpture that is being loved to death practically by the public. What do you mean by that? By that I mean people are touching it. You can see see how it starts green and black and then gets more and more golden as it goes down. And down here, people touch it. they people want to rub his foot. It, sculpture is a very tactile medium and people want to touch it, but the asses in their hands wear the patina off and start wearing the details off over time. So we try to protect it um, by putting coatings on it, which allow people to touch it, but it won't affect the patina. Well, let's all touch it. Let's Come on over it. and let's touch. One last time. Come on, touch. We're loving it to death. And his hands. And his hands. Felipe de Neve, who founded Los Angeles in 1781. And his statue is here on the plaza in Olvera Street, a very public place. Uh, for our second statue. Now we've come over here to the Parker Center and I gotta tell you I know about this one because we've actually done a program here before. Right. But right. it is, I guess this has to be probably the most controversial right. statue Absolutely. in LA. Right. Uh, it was uh, criticized for being communistic because of its semi-abstract design. However, the thing that I, you know, some public art is very informative because of the uh, stories uh, that they 
are trying to recall, like the Philippe de Neva uh, attempts to recall the founding of the city of Los Angeles. This work is important, not because of the uh, design, but because of the controversy surrounding it. And I think that controversy that surrounds this, surrounded this piece when it was installed in 1954-55 tells an awful lot about what Los Angeles was like at that time. And this, I mean, I, you know, you look at it today, and I mean, for the life of me, I can't see anything controversial there. Uh, I, I can't either. What did they say was so controversial? Well, they, they uh, criticized the size of the head. They said that the head doesn't depict, uh, uh, it doesn't have the details of a uh, face. It's too abstract. It doesn't depict somebody, uh, 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 an individual race. In fact, if somebody criticized it for not uh, uh, portraying uh, uh, race. And that made it communist? Yeah, made a communist. Uh, you know, people uh, criticized, wanted to send somebody, a city councilman wanted to send it to Russia. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't sent to Russia, and it has survived right down here in front of the Parker Center. What sh kind of shape is it in? I haven't looked at this one yet. It, well, I think it looks like it's in good shape. The only thing I might be worried about is the sprinklers hitting it. But, yeah. um, and it looks like it survived pretty well, despite all the controversy. Well, we can put some eyes in those faces yeah, and, no, no, and, no. and put some smiling, a smiling mouth and, and make it a good old American statue <laughs> instead of one of those communist yeah. statues. But here it is. This is stop number three. Right here underneath the, the front entrance of Parker Center, it's here for all of us to see and enjoy and kind of flash back in time to the 50s, to the 1950s, when this was very controversial. Now we're downtown in Pershing Square and actually looking over here there are a bunch of statues here. Right, there are three. There's uh, one uh, a, a statue of Beethoven uh, uh, dedicated to the uh, founder of the uh, Los Angeles Philharmonic, uh, William Andrews Clark Jr. There's a monument uh, called the Doughboy uh, which uh, uh, was erected to commemorate and honor the people of Los Angeles who served during World War I. And uh, this uh, monument, which is the oldest uh, statue uh, in the city of Los Angeles. Now, wait uh, a minute. This is the oldest statue in the city of Los Angeles. Right. It was uh, dedicated on May 30th, Memorial Day uh, 1900. And it comm commemorates the uh, uh, people of Southern California who died while serving during the Spanish-American War. The interesting thing is that the uh, 21 people who are listed on the uh, pedestal um, did not die in combat. All 21 died while stationed in the Presidio in San Francisco. The unit, the uh, 7th uh, Cavalry, or 7th Infantry, 7th California infantry uh, was never sent overseas. Uh, so how did they die? From illness, uh, from uh, encephalitis, from bronchitis. So this is a, basically what you're saying is this is a statue to veterans, to the people who died, not right. veterans, people who right. died in the Spanish-American War, but they died in San Francisco. Right of disease, not right. from battle. Right, absolutely. I mean, it's a really an interesting, uh, to me, it's an interesting story of uh, malfeasance. Yeah, I mean, also interestingly, uh, 14 of the uh, people died after the armistice with Spain. I mean, they, you know, that's when actually the disease uh, started really uh, taking its toll on the uh, people. A very strange statue here then. Yeah. I mean, there's a very strange story behind oh, it. absolutely, absolutely. Okay, now we've come to MacArthur Park, and there's a statue here. At first, you'd think it was MacArthur, but that's not MacArthur. No. That is uh, General Harrison Gray Otis, who was uh, head of the Los Angeles Times beginning in 1885 until he died in 1917. Now, this uh, monument picks up on the uh, Spanish-American War Memorial in one sense. Uh, in 1898, uh, Harrison Gray Otis uh, was the first commander of the United States troops in the Philippines 
uh, after the United States took over the Philippines from Spain and uh, he led the uh, American troops in the first effort to put down the insurrection of the Filipino people. So uh, that's why they have him in a general's uniform here instead of dressed as the publisher of the Los Angeles Times. Right, right. Now there's another story here too. Yes, I wanted to mention that this was a memorial that was um, created in 1920 by um, an artist by the name of Paul Trovetskoy, who was the son of a, a Russian prince, fam fairly famous artist at the time. And this memorial had three sculptures, and in fact, now you're only seeing two. So you have Otis, you have a newsboy representing his time with the Los Angeles Times, and then there was a soldier carrying a flag. And um, we're not exactly sure what happened to the soldier, but um, rumor has it that in the, sometime in the 70s it was hit by a car, because we're here not very far from Wilshire Boulevard, and that it was damaged and hauled off and potentially ended up in the basement of the Artist Art Institute across the street and hasn't ever really been found since. So well, We don't know where the third part is. No, but we do have photographs of it, so there's the potential of recreating it and bringing the memorial back to its uh, original shape. I also wanted to mention that there's a good reason why he's here and why he's pointing in the direction that he is, that I think that a lot of people don't realize. He's actually pointing towards the direction of the Otis Art Institute, which was where his um, family home was, and he was the founder of, uh, of Otis. But now that Otis has moved recently to the west side of Los Angeles, it takes on a slightly different meaning. So the family home is not there. The institute itself, the buildings are still there, but it's gone. But the general is still pointing. Pointing on. Now we've come over to the northwest corner of MacArthur Park, and this is a statue I've passed by many times driving down 6th, and it's got Hungary on it, October 23rd, 1956, and then it's got this eagle up on the top. Obviously, this is to the Hungarian freedom fighters. Exactly, and it was erected in the late 60s by the Hungarian community. It took them about 10 years to get the permission and raise the money, which was about $40,000 at the time, to erect this memorial. And since then, they've, um, this community has watched over it and kept it fairly clean. The Hungarian community. Exactly. Now, why did they choose MacArthur Park to put up a monument like this? Well, I think it's because it is one of our oldest and most prominent parks. So it was just a public place. Yes. Now, we're stopping here not only because of the significance of the statue of the memorial itself, but to talk a little bit about restoration. Your name is? Rosa Lowinger from the Sculpture Conservation Studio. And you are? Leslie Fisher from the Cultural Affairs Department, City of Los Angeles. And what we're doing here, let's get up and take a look at it, is cleaning this thing up. Mm -hmm. How hard is it? to clean up these old monuments? Well, they vary. This one actually has been okay. It hasn't been too difficult. It uh, required pretty much washing with water, hosing it down, then washing it with distilled water and a soap solution. It has a lot of paint flecks on the surface from when this monument has been painted, and now we're going to apply a coat of wax as soon as we get all the paint off to protect it. How hard is it to keep these things in good shape? It's not hard, but it takes time. I mean, it takes maintenance, uh, and it takes a regular schedule. If they're done once a year, it's not hard at all. Well, yeah, but once a year, you're talking some money here. That's right. That's... And don't they get beaten up by the weather and by people and by, you know, a variety of sources? Definitely. I mean, the ravages of time do take their toll. That's the nature of outdoor artwork or monuments of any, of any type. But we, you know, are committed to to putting things back on track in the city's collection. Now, how do you choose what you're going to restore and what you're going to let sit around? Well, we were fortunate enough at the city to have an, an assessment survey done a couple years back, at which time um, some conservators helped us rank by rank and prioritize need of various sculptures in the city's art collection. And so we're trying to, you know, of course, attack or restore um, the most needy works first. We're helping to restore them because they have been attacked. Exactly. Right? Right. <laughs> right. This one actually had something interesting that you may or may not be able to see. There was some graffiti on this piece at some point. You can see a... Uh, right here. Right. Now, that's not actual graffiti anymore. What that is, is that there was an attempt to clean it, and it was cleaned improperly. We don't know how, but whatever they used to take the paint off the surface 
corroded it. So now you've got a corrosion spot, so we have to address that. That's why in many cases a bad restoration is worse than doing nothing at all. It has all. to be done correctly. Right. And who, you talk about the, the Hungarian community keeping this up over the years. Who has responsibility for this? The Hungarian community, the city of Los Angeles, who? Well, the works are owned by the city, and so we did first turn to the city to see if it, the city would um, acknowledge its responsibility and begin some of this repair work. We also plan to um, to ask the uh, communities that help bring some of these works into uh, into being to take responsibility also. So I would call it a private part, uh, private public partnership. Yeah. Well. We got one down and about what five hundred to go that need to be cleaned and restored and worked on. Yeah, no, we got more. To, we've done more than that. We've done more. Yeah, and there are about hundred and fifty outdoor sculptures in the Cesar collection, so we're not quite at five hundred. Well, now wait a minute. Where did I hear five hundred? Well, Leslie represents the city of Los Angeles. There are five hundred in the county, so are there are many different cities that own the sculptures. I got you. Okay, just checking on our numbers here because <laughs> we're just going to see ten or fifteen today. We're and, just scraping the surface. Yeah, and bronzes are pieces that are n relatively easy to clean and maintain, and when you don't do them, they're in terrible condition. So bronzes are a good place to start always. Okay, so we've come to a good place. Yeah. Well, let's take a good look at it. This is the monument that was put here to commemorate the Hungarian freedom fighters, October 23rd, 1956, and they're working on it today. Now we've walked over to another part of MacArthur Park for the statue for General MacArthur. And it's very fitting that it be here in MacArthur Park. And there's a history behind this statue as well. It was erected in 1954. Uh, the sculpture itself was um, created by Roger Noble Burnham, who was a well-known sculptor at the time. In fact, he um, also sculpted the Trojan, also known as Tommy Trojan on the USC campus. A lot of statues around the city. Yes. And um, he worked with an architect to develop this entire fountain here. And it's always kind of been a focus for Various protests. It's uh, been scrawled with graffiti, anti-war graffiti during the 60s. Um, and here we have today um, a protest of a different kind. So uh, m military memorials are an interesting rallying point for issues around um, war and peace and military service. Well, we're here with the group of, of veterans. Who wants to be the spokesperson here? You the talker today? Come on, stand yeah, yeah. up and talk with us a little bit. You're here protesting. These are these are Filipino vets yeah, who want Fil compensation from the from the government for work they did yeah. during World War II. World War II, yes. Now, why did you choose this place to we, have your demonstration? We chose this place because uh, General MacArthur was our commander in chief, and he was responsible for the liberation of the Philippines. So this is an obvious place to have your demonstration right here. Yeah. We agreed to have it here. Well, let's and talk for just a minute because this is the other part of the of the statue here. These are the these are all what are we looking at down here? The island. The, the island, island. Where, uh, the island where uh, General MacArthur uh, passes. Well, come on and stand up here and oh. talk to us. What is this one right here? Uh, this is somewhere in Marianas Island. So Mariana. That is uh, Australia. This is uh, Celebes, uh, Indonesia. And this is the Philippines. This you is the got Philippines. the food table up over the Philippines. Yeah, yeah. This one, this one. Uh -huh. This one. Right this here. is Indonesia. Right here. This is the Philippines. Look at this, Louis. We got the Philippines this right is, here. Oh, this is Mindanao. Mindanao. Uh -huh. uh, this is uh, Laiti. Laiti. Where uh, our general, Douglas MacArthur, landed in Laiti. And there's General MacArthur right there. What do you think he would think about this demonstration? Well, here in front of his statue. Well, uh, we came here because this is the place where we chose uh, our demonstration because uh, General MacArthur is our uh, commander in chief during World War II. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we are the remnants now here because our companion is uh, in caravan going to Washington DC from uh, August 24 up to the place, up to September 9. Right. Okay, well we got a demonstration going on here which means that the statues 
are still much more than just symbols of something that happened in the past. Yeah. They're still very much a part of the texture and mm -hmm. the history of what's happening in our city today. Yeah, yeah. And we are demanding our, uh, uh, what we call the equity, uh, equity because uh, we are uh, discriminated by the American people. In fact, that is their duty. And you're doing that right here under the statue of General MacArthur, who's been standing here on this spot since 1954. Now we've come over to the corner basically of Mission and Main. We're in Lincoln Heights and we're in for a treat. Explain to us what we're standing in front of. This is a huge, massive monument right here. Well, let's see, first of all, this area, there's a number of traffic islands here and this area is called Parque de Mexico and it includes uh, two of the uh, three equestrian statues in the city of Los Angeles. And in this one area, it includes the bus of uh, uh, leaders of Mexico, Mexican independence, uh, Mexican uh, uh, rev revolutions in the uh, 1880s, and um, uh, leaders of Mexico in the 19 uh, 20th century. So wait and a minute, there are only three equestrian statues in the entire city of Los Angeles? Yes, and two of them are here. All right, and obviously this is one of them. That's right, a big horse. Right. Who's up there on top of the horse? Uh, em Emiliano uh, Zapata. Uh, Zapata. Zapata. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this work was uh, donated to the city about 1980. But who is Zapata? I don't oh, know who he is. <laughs> Zapata. See, I'm not, that's the point. I don't think many of us know who many of these statues are, are of. Yeah. Well, Zapata was a uh, leader of, uh, uh, he was a leader of an agrarian revolt in southern Mexico uh, in the early uh, 20th century. He established some of the basic principles and laws uh, upon which uh, the uh, agrarian policy of Mexico has followed since then. So and would he be known as a Mexican uh, revolutionary yes, of sorts? He, he was, uh, and he was uh, immensely popular. Uh, the fact is there was a Hollywood movie made uh, uh, called Viva Zapata, starring, starring Marlon Brando. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Now, how would a statue of Zapata get up here in East L.A. in this park? Well, it was donated by the City of Mexico City in 1980 uh, for the cost of about $400,000. So it was a significant contribution. And uh, no doubt it took the Mexican government, the cooperation of the local city. In fact, I'm pretty sure that uh, the council person at the time, who was Arch Schneider, helped a lot of these sculptures come into being and no doubt the support of the local community and neighborhood. Do you think most people know who Zapata is? I think a lot of people around here do in East Los Angeles certainly but you're probably right the larger population of LA doesn't know who he is. Well we know now there he is up there and I think it's interesting he's on one of the three horses that are depicted in, in statues here in L.A. I, I would also like to draw your attention. I don't know what it is. It looks like there was some kind of wreath or something uh, tied to the uh, legs of the uh, oh, statue. The, yeah, the and, horse, the foot of the horse. And, uh, you know, these uh, monuments uh, are uh, uh, the focus of uh, commemorative activity, a, a cycle of commemorative activity uh, by the uh, local community and uh, something may have recently been done here. Now this park is called a uh, parque de mexico well it's a part of lincoln park lincoln, lincoln park, park yeah. which is one of the oldest parks of the city it used to be called east lake park and originally we're right on the edge of the on park the edge, now the very if we get into the park we're going to find a lot of statues right yes all right let's go there he is up there on his horse zapata now we've come into what has to be a real bonanza of statuary and well, these are busts here, but we have two big statues here. Right. 
And this is a uh, monument to Father uh, Hidalgo, who began the revolt in Mexico against Spanish rule. And actually, this uh, monument uh, touches upon really the history of Los Angeles, because at the uh, conclusion of the revolt of Mexico against Spain, uh, California became part of Mexico. And in a sense, uh, the revolt uh, in, uh, against Spain is part of uh, the history of this state. And, uh, you know, he's part of our uh, history. Now, do we, I didn't study, I didn't go to school here in California. Do we study this person in our school system here? Gosh, not that I remember. This is all Mexican history, right? Well, which is certainly a part of our um, contemporary Los Angeles. Right, but this is not necessarily Mexican-American heroes. These are Mexican heroes it's from- Mexico itself. And that actually, um, you can come right here and study the history of modern Mexico with all of the revolutionary and modern war heroes celebrated right here in the, the bus and the equestrian sculptures. And we know who some of these people are. We have names. Uh, heroine of the independence of Mexico. Donna, uh, now wait a minute, I don't know how to pronounce all of these names. Dona, uh, Ortiz um, Dominguez. Right. But we don't know much about her. See, I want to know more about who she is and why she's here. We have a uh, brochure that uh, the or my organization, Urban Art, uh, published with uh, grants from uh, the City of Los Angeles and the National Institute for the Conservation of Cultural Properties. Uh, these brochures will be available for uh, distribution at the uh, various places, uh, including the Plaza de la Raza, uh, and uh, it has uh, histories uh, of each of these uh, busts and statuary in uh, Lincoln Park. Okay, look at this, Louis. We have a, this actually has the place where we're standing right now, and then when you open it up, it has little, uh, a little paragraph about each one of these people here. Right. For example, this character down here who does not have a plaque but who is a name that's familiar to just about everybody. So we, we can look at this and that's number 10 and number 10 is uh, Pancho Villa and we could read up about uh, Pancho Villa. Where is his plaque? He may not have ever had one, or it may be missing. Is that a problem? That's a real problem, because I think a lot of conservation of sculpture has to do with public awareness and getting people to learn about these sculptures, and especially these. This is the history of modern Mexico laid out in front of us, and uh, we need to know about Pancho Villa. So we need a plaque here in English, in English and Spanish. Here's a fellow over here contemplating one of these busts. What are you looking at over here? I don't know. I'm just checking this guy out here. Do you know anything about who these people are? Some of them, but this guy in particular, no, I don't. And like, that guy doesn't have a, a plaque on it. Yeah, well, that's what we were just talking about. But he about. looks like an interesting character, all right. This that's Pancho guy, Villa. That's Pancho Villa. That's, you know, that's who I, I was going to guess. He looks like Pancho Villa with the, uh, the rounds. Now, are you just hanging out over here today looking at... Yeah, my mom's at the hospital, so I'm just wasting time here. Well, don't say wasting time. <laughs> You're here because you're interested in oh, this. Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm interested in all this around here. This whole Lincoln Park and everything, this whole area, you know, it's cool, it's old. Yeah. I'm into that old stuff. Yeah. Old L.A. Well, do you, have you heard of this general down here? Yeah, I've heard of him, but I'm not really sure about him. Besides. General Anacio Zaragoza. Zaragoza, yeah. Well, wait a minute, where's the brochure? We have a brochure for you that lists all oh, of these. this is great. <laughs> See, we did a little commercial for the brochures <laughs> right here. But all of these, uh, come on, let's walk over here. Come on with us. Okay. We've got one more to look at. Here's another one without a, a uh, plaque on him. He looks very distinguished. And we'll get our new friend to tell us a little bit about this fella. Well, is uh, number seven. Where is he? Oh, he's up here. Oh, he's number seven. Number seven. Oh, here we go. Whoa. I have no idea. Venustiano Carranza. 
says uh, Venustiano Carranza, 1859 to 1920, became the head of the provisional government in 1914 after several years of political instability following the overthrow of the dic dictatorship of Porfir Porfirio Diaz. Three years later, Carranza was elected to the first president of the new, blah, 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 of the new Mexican Republic. So this guy is the president, the first president of the new Mexican Republic. Now, do you think this means much to many people today, this history? You know, it should, but I think especially the kids around here are taking it for granted. And, you know, they talk all this stuff about, oh, my history and all that, but I think they really don't know. They should come here and take a look and appreciate the art for what it is. That's my opinion. I don't yeah. know. Well, you're going to get agreement with these people right here because that's what they're into, yeah. is preserving and, 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 and bringing these statues back to life and to more public awareness. Oh yeah, because, I mean, I was noticing some of them are kind of hammered, like in disrepair. And uh, I mean, I think it's great to have this stuff out here, but, you know, especially nobody coming out to look at it or something. Some of those cobwebs on some of these guys. This is an unscheduled stop. We came across the street. Look over here, Louie, this is the plaza where we just were and we've come across the street because I spotted what looks like a classic statue of Lincoln. Yes, that's Lincoln and now we are officially in Lincoln Park. This is a statue by uh, sculptress Julia Bracken went from 1925. So it's, was she a classic, well-known? Yes, trained in the East Coast and did a couple of famous... Yeah, about to get hit. yeah we yes, are about to get hit and actually this is something that we need to talk about as well, correct? Correct. The sprinkler is about to hit Lincoln as we speak. And um, we've been working to try to redirect the sprinklers in this park because if the water hits the sculpture too much, it's going to um, deposit calcium deposits right on the bronze. So there are things going on in the city with the best of intentions that are really not in the best intentions of good health for this statuary. That's right. The sculpture's out there, and we've got the public, we've got air pollution, we've got water from the sprinkling system. hitting Lincoln right now. There we go. And that's not good. It's not keeping him clean because of all the minerals in the sprinkling water. But so there's a good layer of wax on it, so the minerals are depo deposited on top of the wax. All we have to do is remove the wax and replace it about every six months. So. And are we trying to get people in the city of LA up to speed on how to take care of these? Yes, in fact, we held a training here uh, six months ago for the groundskeepers here and taught them how to do some a simple cleaning and simple waxing. And we actually, we did at the time talk about redirecting the sprinkler and I suspect we have to call again. <laughs> Uh-oh, <laughs> we found a problem here, but Lincoln is, is there wet, even though he's not supposed to be, and there's the statue of Lincoln, and we are standing yeah, in. We are standing in Lincoln Park. Now our group is growing. We're still in Lincoln Park in Lincoln Heights, and we have come uh, to this statue right here. We found you all across the street. Your place of business is across the street. Do you know about this statue? Yes, Agustin Lara. Yes, one of the great composers from the old days, and uh, most of his music is based on him now. You know? So you know his music? Oh, definitely. Everybody knows his music. Do you know his music? Do you know who this is? Uh, no, but um, I just found out today. So uh, it's very interesting. I'm going to find out about this uh, composer. Well, now you found out about him because your friend here told you as we were standing here getting ready for this shot. Yes. So we got to get you over in the park more to look at some of these historical statues. There are a bunch of them back there. <laughs> well, I hardly take a lunch. So uh, when I do take a lunch, I'm going to take a stroll over here. It's so close to this uh, business of mine. For 30 years, I don't know who's here in my backyard. Well, that's good. That's what we're trying to accomplish today with this kind of tour of statues throughout the city of Los Angeles is kind of increase all of our awareness. So you're just an example. Yeah. for all of us out there that we all need to know more about things that are in our own backyard, right? Uh, yes, today, yes. Now, Gabrielle, we have you here because you know for sure who this fella is. You're a big fan of his music. Tell us, bring us up to speed on who this is. This is Agustin Lara. 
Lara, right? Okay. Uh -huh. He's actually one of the most famous like songwriters of all time in Mexico and all of Latin America. And uh, his songs have influenced like everyone from uh, Luis Miguel, who's the current pop artist, to Edie Gourmet, who's recorded some of his songs, as well as a lot of other artists that, that we know and don't know. But he's really famous, really important. He was a poet, a really controversial writer for his time. And uh, a lot why was he controversial? Well, he used to write a lot about sex and a lot about um, about into being intoxicated. And, uh, but he would do it so poetically that people would have a hard time trying to really nail him as, as being a, uh, like a person full of vice. But actually, he was, he was a, that, that means that he was a really good writer. And he was able to really bring a lot of life into his writing. And when was he writing? What was his era? His era was mainly uh, in the 20s and 30s. His, most of his recordings date back to like the 30s. It's him on the piano with a small uh, group with violin. And it's really beautiful stuff he sings. Usually, he's just known as a songwriter, but there's some recordings of him singing. It's really... Now, Amazing. isn't there a, let's walk over here, isn't there a, a legend here that talks about the songs that he has, that right. he has written? Right, yeah, I have uh, Granada, which actually is a song that he wrote at, about Spain, which he had never even been to Spain, which actually shows how great of a writer he actually was. Um, and then Solamente Una Vez, which is a song we're going to sing, and there's Mujer Noche de Ronda, is a song that Edi Gourmet recorded, and Madrid, another song about Spain that he wrote without actually ever being there. So this man is really very famous. Oh yeah, he's, he's one of the most important figures in, in, in Latin music. Well, could you and your friend, let's have you just stand right out here and we'll have you perform. Let's stand over here in front of the statue so that the statue will kind of be in the background. And uh, come on over here and sing one of his songs. Okay, we're going to do a little bit of Solamente Una Vez. We'll do a verse. Okay. okay. Solamente una vez Amé la alma Solamente una vez Y nada más Una vez nada más En mi huerto vio la esperanza La esperanza que alumbre el camino de mi soledad Very nice. <laughs> now we've just come from the plaza across the street here with all the bust. Yeah. Do you think that the young people in this area know who these people were? Well, I think it's, uh, there was a point in time when it, I think the information was not uh, like taught to the youth, especially Chicano youth. But I think now as there's a new movement growing and more solidarity between Chicanos and there's more information people are starting to know about these people like Pancho Villa. I mean, Pancho Villa is like... Now a, I've heard of Pancho Villa. A folk hero, but a lot of the other stories of Pancho Villa or the other people that are in the park. I mean, there's a lot of people. There's a Benito Juarez. I mean, those kind of information on like who these people are. Just, you know the names, but you don't know the history behind who these people are. And it's like people are now figuring out for themselves, like, hey, we got to learn it ourselves. So they go out and go to the library or they find out from other friends and who these So you are. think these statues are meaningful and are serve a real purpose here in the community? Yeah, I think the sad part about it though is that there's a lot of empty spaces that because money ran out, they weren't finished. And I think that has that project has to be taken up. Yeah. Probably by youth. In Mexico, I mean, the, you you can travel all over Mexico and you can see statues just all over the place. I mean, you see just on the sides of the road. You can see amphitheaters there where they would have large statues and some of them would be of just common people where they would be working on the bridge and then there would be a statue in commemoration of the people who have died or people who had worked on there. So I mean, I think within the Latino community or the Mexican community, it's a tradition to do statues of people like Agustin Lara. Really? Or Emiliano Zapata. So, so I mean, this comes, this is a Mexican tradition. I would say, I think uh, pay, paying tribute to people like Agustin Lara is something that's common. You see it a lot. I mean, it's like, these are, I guess you could say folk heroes. So they don't have to be just political heroes. They can just be the people. I mean, Mexico is made up of people, and so it's like in the tradition 
in the spirit, I guess you could say, of almost like, of, of I guess it would be of the society of La Sociedad that you pay tribute to the people that work. Well, he worked and brought us good music. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your name? Tylona. Thank you all for coming over. And our statue journey continues. We just have a few more to go. We are running out of time. Now, Julie, usually when you think of statues, you think of parks. You do. Statues in parks. And when you think of statues, you think of statues, like of men or women standing erect in uniform or whatever, or on horseback. Or on horseback. But now we've come to a place that is neither a park or a traditional statue in the terms that we tend to think of statues. Why are we here in this shopping center in Watts? Well, we're here um, in the commercial heart of Watts, the Martin Luther King Shopping Center, which was rebuilt on the site of uh, the old uh, downtown business area of Watts that was burned in the 1965 Watts Rebellion. And so it's a really important place in the history of um, Los Angeles and of this particular community. And this just happens today to be a commercial shopping center. But the community for a very long time really wanted to memorialize this location and the important events that happened here and always wanted a memorial to Martin Luther King. And so um, the opportunity came about to have it here and it was paid for by the Community Redevelopment Agency. And here it is over here and this to me, it looks like a piece of sculpture, not a statue. Well, in fact, you would call it a sculpture. That's much more of a modern term to describe the kinds of public art memorials that come about. Statues is somewhat a, an old-fashioned term, and in fact, as you were mentioning, is much more about a kind of stiff character. So the statues today are more like sculptures? Yes, sculptures, and this is a sculpture with many meanings. It's not just a figure of a person, but it's about the life, philosophies, and contributions of that individual. And here in the middle of deep conversation is the artist. Yes, Charles Dixon. Charles, how you doing? How you doing, you? Nice to see you, nice sir. Nice to see you, too. <laughs> We're here to talk about the hand, and mm -hmm. when I met you a minute ago, before we started the cameras rolling, you said, everybody calls it the hand, nobody ever talks about the rest about, of it. That's right. <laughs> So it's pretty much uh, uh, the hand is an icon within the community. Now, what is all this about? Well, let's walk over here so we can uh, get a good look at it because it's a beautiful big hand with this bird. It looks like a right. hummingbird to me. It is a hummingbird. Why is it a hummingbird? Well, for one thing, we in the model, when I first uh, developed the concept of, of a bird being released in, from my hand, I, uh, I modeled the bird to kind of like be a, a, a combination dove and it kind of looked more like a hummingbird. And the concept of the hummingbird suddenly uh, dawned on me that it was like an African culture, an, an, uh, it's Asian culture, it's, it's Mexican, it's a lot of different things. And, and, and the piece represents that kind of thinking. Um, and you know, we all have a dream. And so that's, that is inscribed on, on this work the entire speech. I thought that was very important. That's over here. That's over here. Right? We have an entire, oh gosh, you do have the entire oh I have a dream I speech a dream here. Speech. Yeah, and, and, what, and basically uh, uh, one of the criterias for the work was um, was to have an image of Martin Luther King on the, on the piece itself. And so what happened is that we, I, I didn't want to just put a, a bust of him there, but I made sure that uh, the image is there. And so this is the actual sh uh, photograph or, that was taken, flipped, like a butterfly type of thing. I got you. Uh, of him actually giving that speech. In and what are, what are the footsteps here, Does the gold? Really? They're, they're, they're brass, but the interesting thing about the footsteps is that uh, we wanted to use one of the shoe types that he actually wore, his size shoe. Now, are they made for people to stand up there oh, and step in his shoes? Exactly. May I do that? Certainly. Certainly. So you can just stand right here and That's step. Right. Would you like to step in the footsteps here? See, there he goes. That's part of what you wanted to do, That's too. That's part of what we wanted. We initially wanted to use his real shoes to get this impression, 
but they're sealed in, in the museum. Mm -hmm. And so we looked all over town to find the, the actual shoe. And after we exhausted every possibility, we found the store right next door to the monument had the shoe. That Martin Luther King? That the tights that he wore. Really? Stacy Adams, yeah. Wow. Boston style. And so we took that impression and cut it out in the brass and then embedded it into the granite. Well, you have a beautiful uh, piece of work here. I guess this is a modern day statue. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a modern interpretation of what the term statue means. Yeah, in that sense. I, I think I really consider it more of a monument. And in, in, in that loose term, you can, you can project any kind of possibility. And um, it, it can, it's composed of statues, in a sense, or, or symbols. And it's here where people can enjoy it and see it and stand here and actually read the entire speech. That's right. That's right. Now, I was watching you standing here reading the speech. Yes. Had you ever seen the whole speech out like this before? Yes, I've seen the speech before. I'm a, I was a college graduate, so I looked at the speech in undergraduate school and in other places, but I never uh, recalled the context of the speech, the entire speech. Uh -huh. So I reread it today and I saw aspects of it that I saw as bits and pieces in other forms. So it felt real good for me to look at it, the context of what he was saying. So you actually stood here, read the speech, and, and gained something from being a part of of this sculpture. Yes, uh, when Dr. King gave this speech, I was five years old. I was born right there in the Harbor General Hospital. And I did gain something because I, 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 I saw what he meant when he was talking about the blank, the blank check. He was referring to the Constitution. And so the Constitution itself is our liberty. And if we deny freedoms, that means that the check that we have, which is our Constitution, is being denied us. So the inf insufficient funds is the fact that our rights are not being upheld in some ways. So, so Charles, really, this this is exactly, is this what you wanted to happen as the artist? To, absolutely. To see people stop and, I mean, it's like it's alive. Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, you may not get everyone, but once in a while you'll get that one individual that really stops and reads the whole thing and, uh, and gets a great uh, uh, breakthrough from it. Well, you know, we're on this whirlwind tour of Los Angeles statues today. I heard that. We've been all over the place. We're oh. running them ragged. <laughs> and we were thinking about where we could cut, you know, where are we going to go, where are we not going to go, because we can't get all 15 that we had started off to see today. I'm glad we didn't cut this one, because oh, this, is, this is a beautiful and a very inspirational piece and an example of a, of a piece that actually belongs to a community. It's located in a community and it's, it, it speaks to a community. That's right, and the community worked very hard over a period of about five or 10 years, actually, just in trying to get past the politics and to present the piece. A lot of politics. Oh, man, absolutely. <laughs> We're talking public art here. <laughs> I guess that's something we hadn't really talked about. It's probably a good thing we hadn't, but I'm sure that every statue in this city, regardless of when it was erected, had to go through the politics at the time absolutely. to get it erected. The approval. And it's, it's something that I guess that's part of what it's all about yes. is politics. <laughs> but I'm glad you overcame the politics. Oh, yeah, right. You stuck we with did. it. You, you worked through <laughs> all the bureaucracy <laughs> yes. and you got your piece. Well, we had fun. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. Well, we are ending up here in downtown, the old downtown of Englewood, standing right in front of this wonderful old Art Deco 1930s WPA kind of a post office which is obviously still in operation and we have come here to take a look at one last statue Julie and this statue kind of points up what? That uh, memorials can be uh, erected to uh, all kinds of people and uh, even dogs. And that the memorials, the statues don't have to be grand or wonderful they can be wonderful in their own little way. Yes, they can be appropriately scaled. Okay, appropriately <laughs> scaled. That was a kind way of putting it because this is where we're headed, right here to the little statue here to Penelope called Rex, a faithful dog which followed the mail carrier on Route 15 in Englewood daily for more than 13 years. This fountain was erected through popular subscription received from citizens and friends to animals. 
November 25th, 1936. And that really sums it up, doesn't it? It does, this is absolutely our smallest memorial. Well, and it's also, to me, poignant because it, it was raised with money from the, from the people. Right, right, that they cared enough uh, about something and uh, they wanted it memorialized and recalled in future generations. Well, it all works, whether they're big statues or little statues, whether they're statues to famous popular figures or to obscure figures, whether they're in need of repair or whether they have been touched and loved like this little statue has, they're all part of who we are as a community, aren't they, Julie? They absolutely are. I like the fact that this one has a, um, that it's scaled to the size of dogs and that there's a little lap pool here in the front for them to take a drink. Right. So it's, it's useful as well. As well. Well, it all works. And if we've learned anything from this adventure today, because we have just scrape the surface. We have not even been to the statues that were on our list, have we? Right. We have many more. We have skipped about five or six of them. And we could supply you even with more. Yeah, we have, <laughs> we have hundreds of statues throughout Southern California, all over Los Angeles. And I guess we should all be aware now that we should stop and just spend a minute or two looking at them, reading the legends they have care about repairing them and keeping them in, in good operating order because they really are a part of our community, part of who we are. And hopefully we've all learned a little bit more appreciation of these statues through our tour today. Thank you for joining us. And uh, let's all start looking at our statues from now on and enjoying them. Goodbye, everybody. Solamente una vez. Amen, la la la. Solamente una vez y nada más. Una vez nada más en mi huerto vio la esperanza, la esperanza que el el camino de mi soledad Visiting with Hewell Hauser is made possible through a generous grant from the Ralph M. Parsons Foundation. Mm -hmm.